great city. Congratulations, Martin. So, uh, my name is Lev, and today uh, I would like to talk about the chaos theory. This field, chaos theory, is surrounded by a fair number of myths and misunderstandings, but at the end of the day, chaos theory is a legitimate science, and today I would like to give you a glimpse on what the science is about. And to really motivate the talk, I would like to ask one simple question. Why is it so difficult to forecast weather? I mean, we have sent man to the moon, and mission to the moon and back takes approximately two weeks. So when we send man to the moon, we are approximately sure that in two weeks he will be safe and back. But we are not able to say whether it will rain in two weeks from now. By the way, when I was leaving Krakow three days ago, the forecast was that it's going to rain right now. We are lucky that it does not. Okay, so why is it so difficult to forecast weather? Actually, uh, we can turn this question around and instead ask why do we expect ourselves to be able to forecast weather? Why do we expect it to be possible or even easy? Why do we think that we have the power to know what is going to happen in the future? Well, largely it's because of this guy. Uh, his name is Isaac Newton, and some centuries ago, he came up with few very simple equations that describe the evolution of physical systems. And these equations are applicable to very simple systems, like this pendulum, and also the exact same simple equations are applicable to the very complex system, like what Newton himself calls the great celestial clock. The simple rules of classical mechanics allow us, allow us to forecast eclipses, appearance of comets, position of planets, hundreds of years in advance, with tremendous accuracy. And of course, the major achievement of this tradition is the fact that we have sent men to the moon. So this uh, field is a huge success, but uh, for 300 years there was one idea which doesn't really come from Newton's equations, and it was really taken for granted and not carefully thought through. And this idea is reductionism. Reductionism is the idea that uh, models of objects are approximately the same as real objects. We can study the model of the rocket before we build a real rocket. Yes, no model is perfect, and there will be some small differences, but small differences do not matter. Okay? Small differences in input lead to small differences in output, and we end up on the moon, even though we started model of a rocket, we did not uh, test fly real rockets. And so this tradition was very successful, and this mechanistic <laughs> of the universe was really synonymous for science for over 300 years. And one of the descendants of this tradition was this guy named Edward Florence. For some reason there are a lot of scientists whose name is Florence, and there is even Florence Florence equation, and there are uh, two different Florences. So this Lawrence was named Edward, and he was a meteorologist, meteorologist in MIT. So he came up with something that sounded like a good idea at the time. He wanted to model weather. So he came up with a few simple equations, not unlike Newton's. And these equations uh, describe the evolution of weather. Weather as a system that is modeled by few parameters, like temperature, wind speed, humidity, and so on. And so he had some equations which approximately describe how these parameters are going to evolve over time. Unlike Newton, he also had a real, real evolving even all this in the one you see on the screen now. Okay, so he played with this system for a while, and uh, at some point he did the following, because he didn't go very small. Uh, he asked the system to predict uh, weather from 1st January up to 1st February, then to write down the predictions for 1st of February, and then uh, he re-entered these uh, numbers into the machine and asked, given the temperature, uh, given the weather on 1st February, predict the uh, weather on 1st May. Okay, so the machine ran from the prediction from 1st of January to 1st of May, with him in between reading uh, data from the current state, uh, current situation uh, from the screen and re-entering it back. 
Lincoln, for some reason, he decided to rerun the same experiment, but without this intermediate step. So it was just the machine running all the weights from the first gap to the first gap. And something very, very interesting happened. The predictions did not match. So uh, in the first case and in the second case, the machine output very different weather forecast for the first match. It was weird. It should not happen. There is no element of randomness in Lawrence's equations. They are completely deterministic. Deterministic is the opposite of randomness. So he thought that maybe there is some mistake somewhere. Maybe hardware fails. Maybe something else is wrong. But it turned out not to be the case. Instead, he found something very, very interesting. Specifically, the problem was that when the uh, machine represented numbers internally, it did it with six decimal places, so you see it on the left. But when the machine output numbers to Lawrence, it rounded them up to three decimal places, like you see in the middle of the screen. And so when Lawrence re-entered these numbers to the machine, he also did it with three decimal places, because the rest was not available. So that's what happened uh, in his first experiment, when he re-entered data into the machine. He rounded up the intermediate state of the system. And during the second round, the machine has run uh, all the way through internally without this rounding. And it turned out that this very, very small difference in fourth decimal place led to the big difference in the outcome of the system. And if we plot the temperature of these two forecasts with round and without round, we will see something like this. So we see that initially these two forecasts are very close to each other, indistinguishably close. Then they start to diverge, like sort of circles the same trajectory, but then at some point these forecasts diverge just completely and predict totally different situation of weather. And this is not some artifact of randomness in the system. There is no randomness. And it's not the failure of the hardware or the algorithm that we create. It's just an intrinsic property of the equations he created. And when he realized this effect and published the paper around it, we received the central and most famous metaphor of the chaos theory, the butterfly effect. The flap of butterfly wings in Brazil can cause tornado effects. This is exactly how he called the, the paper that he described. So effectively, what Lawrence did is he, dis uh, he discovered the boundaries of reductionism. Systems that exhibit this kind of behavior cannot be reduced to the model, because the small difference in initial conditions will lead to a dramatic difference in the evolution of the system. So chaos is not about randomness. Chaos is about sensitive dependence on initial conditions. When very small difference in arbitrarily small difference in some steps later uh, result in totally different trajectory of, uh, of system evolution. Um, it turns out that weather is not only system that exhibits this kind of behavior. Actually, in 40 years and past things, we have discovered all kinds of chaotic systems all over the place. And it seems like there was some mental bias that did not allow us to discover this uh, systems before. Uh, remember this simple pattern I did. Well, it turns out that if we replace pendulum with double pendulum, that is, if we stick another pendulum at the loose end of the first one, the system becomes chaotic. And here you see the video of eight. Uh, this pendulum has been uh, run from approximately the same position eight times. And you see that basically after the first swing, these different experiments completely diverged. And by now they are doing totally different things. Even though they start indistinguishably close. And even this great celestial block work that Newton described with his famous works, it turns out it's chaotic as well. And this paper, the link you see here, uh, it runs this very simple uh, Newton laws um, 600 million years in advance, given the difference in uh, planet positions of 5 centimeters. So we model evolution of solar system 500 uh, 600 million years in advance given current position of planets plus or minus 5 centimeters. 5 centimeters is a very low error. It's actually much lower error than, than, than what we have with real uh, devices that we have in our planet positions. And it turns out that if we do this, then 600 years later, Mars lies with Mercury. Or it does not lie with Mercury. It depends on initial conditions. 
solar system, which is a great celestial clock, is an example of chaotic system. And uh, by the way, do you recall this thing that we shot to the moon? Actually, by shooting this thing to the moon, we moved Earth's orbit approximately by 5 centimeters. Um, recently, uh, there are evidence growing that even more interesting systems are exhibiting chaotic behavior. The very fact that you are here as a response of the teeny bits of light that reach your retina and are carrying information about this event uh, is very strong suggestion to me that human beings are chaotic systems as well. This is actually our strength that allows us to react to the world and adapt. <laughs> So, uh, this guy you see on the left of the slide, his name is Mohamed Bouazizi, and he was a street trader in Tunisia, and he was unhappy about Tunisian government. So he set himself on fire as a sign of protest. He held the blame. Actually, this kind of protest is violent, but actually there are events of this kind happening every year. It's not some unique event. But this particular event turned out to be extremely consequential. Uh, and it sparked a series of rebellions that we now call Arab Spring. And this guy, Stephen Mann, who was a uh, policy advisor for the previous White House administration, he argues that chaos theory is the best way to describe the evolution of social system, uh, the social dynamics. And because we cannot predict and measure the state of the mind of every street trader in Tunisia, we cannot pro produce a reliable forecast of how the social systems are going to evolve in future. Because it turns out that even these small events can have huge consequences that are in sense deterministic, but are not predictable for our outside view. Which means that organizations that run on doing this very long-term, very precise control uh, of social dynamics uh, lo long time into the future are simply not possible. Sorry, apparently we do not have a functioning world government. It's, it's not possible to control what is going to happen like, with entire mankind hundreds of years in advance. Um, but actually, what can we do about this chaotic things in the world? Okay, we discovered them, we know something about their behavior, and what else? We just give up on weather forecasts entirely, because they are chaotic and unpredictable. Actually, there is something we can do. Uh, we cannot make a perfect prediction, but we can measure how much perfect is our prediction. And to do it, we do basically the same thing as Lawrence did. So we run this system, which is like Lawrence system. Not from uh, one point, which is our current measurement system, but from a series of points that are clustered very close together. So, approximately, like, right now my thermometer says it's 17 uh, degrees Celsius, but maybe it's 16, uh, 17 and a half, or maybe it's 16 and a half. And when we run uh, this series of forecasts together, it's called ensemble forecast, we can see how rapidly these trajectories diverge. And here, uh, I'm not sure it's really visible, but here on, on the chart there are shades of blue that denote the margin of error, the margin of uncertainty, the major, the margin of chaos created up to this point in the system. And we see that, okay, so for three or three and a half days, the margins of error are pretty slim. So in this case, the forecast is pretty reliable three and a half days in advance. But then the difference is magnified, and the week later at the right edge, edge of the chart, the differences are so wide that it makes no sense to make this forecast. So we cannot um, cancel this chaotic nature of, of the world. But we can tame it and we can measure it numerically. It's better than, than nothing. So that's the end of my talk. And to sum up on something positive, I would like to suggest you to be complex, to be chaotic. Because if you do so, nobody will be able to control your actions. And if you follow this link, you will be able to find some materials that I, refer that I referenced in this talk and also some further if you are interested in learning more about chaos. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We will have like five minutes for your questions. There are people with microphones in the audience and if you just raise a hand, they will come there. 
There's a guy in blue. We need sound for the microphone. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, if both a pendulum and the solar system can be described by Newton's equation, why one of them is chaotic and the other one is not? Uh, actually, Newton's equations are also chaotic equations. And we see it, on, for instance, in double pendulum very clear. There is no like magical quantum effects. As a double pendulum is entirely described by Newtonian dynamics. It's like schoolboy can, uh, can a model for it. It just we ignore this point up to a certain point. With solar system, uh, the, the thing is that it's chaotic, but uh, it's chaotic on very long range of time. So right now, when we write, uh, when we run simulation for solar system for time spans that are comparable to human life, uh, the differences created by chaos are so small that they don't matter for us. But 600 million years in advance and we have chaos. So Newtonian dynamics is chaotic. It's, there is no contradiction here. Sorry, that, I, I think I didn't get why then the single pendulum is not chaotic if the Newton's equation are intrinsically chaotic. Well, some Newtonian systems are chaotic and some are not. Uh, pendulum is an example of systems that is not chaotic. Generally, the physical system has to have three degrees of freedom to be chaotic. And uh, pendulum is described by its current velocity and position, so it has only two degrees of freedom. Double pendulum has four degrees of freedom. Okay, anyone else? Then I have a question. So, uh, you work in artificial intelligence. I do. Yes. And you said that this chaos theory is slightly connected to what you do. So, what, how? Like, shouldn't artificial intelligence be very predictable and unchaotic, or again, I, am I getting it wrong? Well, up to a certain point, we tried to create artificial intelligence systems that are not chaotic and predictable and understandable to us, and it did not work quite well. Okay. And uh, some, like, 10 years ago, having the major revolution with transition to widespread usage of neural networks. And neural networks are chaotic and they are not not understandable. We cannot look inside and understand what's going on. So it's uh, the field is very relevant to artificial intelligence and this exactly. We even use some, uh, some of the same tools of mathematics as in chaos. Okay. I guess we can take one more. And if no one has one, I have one. But oh, there's one, yeah. And this is coming, great. Sorry for stealing your time. No, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> so I was just wondering, so you said a chaotic system is chaotic because it, like, how it behaves really depends on the initial conditions. Now, is there really any sort of like hard cutoff where you say, okay, if it's this sensitive to the initial condition, it's chaotic one, and, you know, is there any sort of boundary that you can draw or are there systems where you like could be described as chaotic or just not chaotic? Um, yeah, there is a very simple metaphor for this uh, that is used to describe it to newcomers to the field. So imagine that you have a ball uh, on, an, on the top of the mountain and it's balanced exactly at the top. And if you move it, move it slightly to the left, it will fall to the left slope. And if you move it slightly to the right, it will walk, move along the right slope. Now imagine the ball in the, this bowl-like shape. And it doesn't matter if you shift it to the left or to the right, it will return to the same position. So the property of chaotic system is that the small differences magnify over time. And the property of non-chaotic system, uh, systems is that small differences either stay the same or disappear over time. Cool, thanks very much. Yeah, yeah, then thank you for the talk and answering the questions.